Welcome everyone. This is the session Women and Investigative Journalism Tips on Leadership. And I hope you are here because you know what we're going to talk about, but basically leading women investigative journalists from around the world would share concrete leadership tips and tricks that help them along their careers. The idea is that each of them will cover different aspects, so we are not all focusing on the same. So my name is Gabriela Manuli. I'm the deputy director of the Global Investigative Journalism Network. I'm originally from Argentina, but I live in Hungary, in Budapest. And I'm also an investigative reporter, but I've been working for GIGN uh, for already like eight years. So yeah, a long time. Uh, we believe that this session is very important because especially in journalism, us female reporters are lacking a lot of formal training on leadership. And we are always trying to learn and we go and scrambling bits and pieces. So the idea is try to provide uh, good things here. I'm here with my co-moderator Silke and soon we will introduce you all the speakers. So what can we do? There are books, there are in, you can get an informal or formal mentor, you can find some training, but let, let's try to give a head start with this session. Um, just a brief idea, this is, um, this is related to GIJN Women. GIJN Women is a group that was formed after our conference in 20, uh, 2019 in Hamburg, we had a very, very moving session with 10 female journalists from all over the world. They, are, they were sharing a lot of things related to, to how to survive in a way, strategies for survival it was called. So I highly recommend that you go to our YouTube channel and you take a look. After that, in, in November, 2019, we started this GIGN women group that is open to all uh, women and non-binary uh, journalists and uh, non-binary uh, journalists that want to to help each other support we've been doing meetups so I, I highly recommend that that you share and also in the same spirit of these informal meetups now after this session right away we will be having a, a meetup too so I hope you all can come and discuss with us so let me give you the floor to Silke so we can get the session started Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. I'm very happy to see you all in this digital room. Um, my name is Silke Grunwald. I'm a freelance reporter and I will be co-moderating this session together with Gabby. And we would like, first of all, and for most, we would like to welcome um, to the digital stage, Rachel, Ravan, Motenrayu, Sherry and Marina. Um, we're gonna start on the macro level with Marina, who uh, Marie, uh, with Rachel, sorry, Rachel, you are the managing editor and CEO of the Bureau of Investigative Journalism in the United Kingdom. Um, and when we say macro level, you will sort of help us navigate the sphere of investigative reporting. Um, you will be followed by Ravan. Um, Ravan, you are the director general of Arich, the Arab Reporters for Investigative Journalism. Um, followed by our third speaker today, who is Martin Rayo. Hi there. Um, Martin you are the executive director and CEO of the Volsinkia Center for Investigative Journalism based in Nigeria. And we're happy to have Sherry with us. Sherry, you are the editor-in-chief of The Reporter and an adjunct professor at the Graduate Institute of Journalism at the National Taiwan University. And we're finishing off the session with you, Marina. Um, and by then we're gonna be at, on the very, very micro level um, when you were talking about managing yourself. And you are the executive editor with the Pulitzer Center on crisis reporting based in DC. Um, so without further ado, Rachel, the stage is yours, talking about managing the investigative reporting ecosystem. Thanks, okay, and um, morning for those people who are still in morning, good afternoon for those who are in the afternoon, and a good evening for all of you on the other side of the world who are now in your evening time. Um, I am so delighted to be on this panel, and I really want to thank GIJN for putting this panel on because it is such um, an important discussion point. Um, you know, women do represent, make up half of the population in the world, and yet there are um, just few, few conversations and few representatives um, from that side of the um, population in our industry. Um, so I want to just talk a little bit about how as a woman, you have you go about navigating the ecosystem. 
Um, I am going to now try and share my screen, which so just give me a couple of minutes or a couple of seconds, hopefully. Um, There we go. Hopefully you can see all of it. Um, so I'm Rachel Aldroyd. I'm the managing editor and CEO of Bureau of Investigative Journalism based in London. Um, and I have worked in this area for um, about 25 years. And I've been in an editorial leadership role for about 20 years. I've been at the Bureau for just over 12, started as the deputy editor. And I've been the managing editor and CEO for the past seven. Um, and for much of that time, it's felt quite a lonely place. Um, when I first started in my role, I was thinking about this a couple of days ago, um, 25 years ago when I started in journalism, I was on a commissioning desk. Um, there were, I was the only woman on that commissioning desk. My direct manager was a man. My news editor was a man. My section editor was a man. The news editor of the paper was a man. The, Deputy editor was the man, the head of news was a man, and guess what? The editor was a man. And 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when I joined the Bureau, um, I was, my editor was a man. On the board, we had one woman, and on the advisory committee, we had one woman. So, you know, a little bit better, but still not great. Um, and when I, one of the first meetings I had, um, in my role as deputy editor of the Bureau, I went to have a meeting with um, a newspaper that we wanted, that we were working on a story with collaboratively. This was one of our most liberal um, sort of forefront newspapers in the UK. And I entered the room to talk about this story that we were going to work with them. There was 10 people in that room. And I realized within 20 seconds that I was the only woman in that room. Um, and I found myself in that place quite a lot of my career. But I really wanted to make it, to, to say just a couple of things about how things have changed, because I do think things are changing. And there are a lot more women out there. And we look at this panel it's made up of women all in very high leadership roles who have run some of the biggest stories that our industry has ever seen, which is amazing. Um, at the Bureau, we now have a board that it has more women on it than men. Um, in our senior, ed, senior management team, we have six women out of eight. In our senior edit team, we have three women out of five. And increasingly, I'm finding myself in a room where there are other women. But, you know, there, it's, we still need to talk about this and there are still tips that I would like to share with you. So how do we go about navigating it? I think one of the first things to think about is that our own style, our style as women is often very different um, to the style that men take in investigative reporting. So we tend not to be the lone wolf investigative reporters. Um, we tend to be better at sharing, at collaborating, at networking, at empathizing, and all of these skills are extraordinarily important in investigative journalism and really value them. And, you know, you don't have to replicate being that traditional lone wolf reporter. Talk about networking, talk about collaboration, being able to empathize with your source is such a skill. Really value your own style and your own skills as a woman. Those times when you do find yourself as the only woman in the room, I would say lean into that situation. In, in many ways, the only woman in that room of 10 people it was my voice was way more important than the other nine people because I brought a completely different perspective to that story, to that investigation. So it was so important that my voice was heard and that I made my voice heard. And sometimes you have to say that I'm the only woman in this room. You have to listen to me because I can bring a perspective that other people in this room just can't offer you. Um, seek out other women, as I've said, the story is getting better. There are so many more women operating in journalism at large and many more women operating in investigative reporting. So go and seek those women, go and find um, female editors, publishers, collaborators. They are your friends. They will share the same experiences. They will share the same issues. So go and seek them out because you can help share those frustrations. 
and sell your female centered work. I think this is one of the massive changes that I've seen in my career that over the last five years or so, female centered investigations have suddenly become extraordinarily important. Think of Me Too, think of rape as a war crime, think of um, <laughs> police um, investigations into domestic violence and rape. These issues now are at the forefront and they are getting readers, they're getting clicks, they're winning awards. Remind your editor when um, they push back on female centered work that this is important and it is valued by the readers um, and the public. Um, one thing that is often overlooked is how much help and support many of these investigations, which are particularly female centered investigations, they tend to be very hard. They tend to deal with very vulnerable sources. If you're thinking about rape victims or, or Me Too story, these need, these need additional support um, above the type of support that is usually given in, invest in investigative work like security and so on. Really ask for that support. You know, vicarious trauma is a real thing. People investigating these subjects do need help and support on that level. So ask for it. Don't feel you're weak by asking for it. And finally, and I think this might prove to be a theme through this panel, give yourself a break. Being the only voice in the room is really, really hard. Fighting for those female focused stories is, in a male industry is really, really hard. Keep fighting, but also look after yourself and just recognize that the type of stories that you're doing and constantly being pushed back on can be very draining and very hard work. So just take a step back and just accept that you are good enough and you can do it and that to feel a bit emotional about things is okay. Um, so those are my tips and I'm going to hand over now to, I can't remember who was next. So okay, if you perhaps guide me. I'm very happy to help. Thank you very, very much, Rachel. Um, and specifically for pointing out to look after oneself. Um, but before we get into the point of managing oneself, um, I would like to ask Ravan to join us. And Ravan, you will tell us how to manage the growth of an organization. Um, and in your case, it's Arich. Um, thank you very much. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rachel. I cannot agree more. I also working in documentaries and investigative journalism for the last 20 years. And 10 of them was in Al Jazeera in Doha, Qatar. And in most of those 10 years, I was the only woman in all committees of commissioning and documentary filmmaker and investigative journalism. So I cannot agree more on everything that you uh, mentioned. Uh, I would like uh, to uh, talk a bit about the growth in Arish and then how this was done in tip tips that might be useful to uh, many of you, hopefully. So um, let me go quickly into uh, what does the growth of Arish means. Uh, let me do this. So. The growth in Ariège means first the number of um, uh, partners uh, signing MOUs with them. In 2018, we had four. Today, we have over 20 partners. In terms of workshops with the COVID times and shifting to virtual, we had the chance to have a lot more growth in our virtual and actual workshops. Number of trainers. Uh, this year, we have almost more than 100 uh, in 2018. 19, we had 33. In terms of female trainers, we managed to have 60% uh, females in 2020, and still 2021 is ongoing, and we hope that we will reach the 50%. And in terms of trainees, we had a big growth from uh, 2018 until today. And uh, the percentage of female trainees, uh, where we hope uh, that always we will get 50% plus of female trainees in investigative journalism in the Arab world, MENA region where we work, Middle East and North Africa. In terms of investigations, we had a growth in the number of those investigation. Uh, maybe I'll put in the chat later an investigation with gender perspective. And this of course reflected itself in the budget growth and in the number of donors who trusted us and supported us. 
Uh, also, our annual forum, we are preparing for that. And uh, last year we had 1,500. Hope that this year we'll have more. I'll also put a link for those who are interested. We'll have a bilingual sessions uh, pre-forum starting this month and our annual forum is from the 3rd until the 5th of December. And in terms of the team, uh, we expanded and we had the growth from 20 in 2018 to 30, half of them freelancers in uh, 2021. So how we did that? And basically, what can I say in terms of the tips? I'll try to summarize this in 10 secrets of managing your investigative journalism NGO growth. I would say first, define your growth objectives. Remember that it is like a snowball. One aspect of growth is always connected to all the other aspects of growth. Second, always think ahead. Spend at least 30% of your day planning. So always plan your next step and plan strategically, especially if you live in a region where uh, it's constantly changing all the time and very difficult and dangerous to be an investigative journalist. The third is hire the right people and take your time into this and sleep on it. To grow, you need uh, different people, people who can move fast and break barriers, who can do multitasking, and not everybody can cope with growth. The fourth is empower your team, especially female uh, members, young female investigative journalists. Gradually handle responsibility to them while keeping over the macro of the NGO. And the fifth, embrace technology and new technology, as without technology, there is no growth. The sixth is to innovate. Think always of new things that were never tried before. You need the courage to innovate. And in our region, there is a big stereotype um, having, you know, that women and technology and women and innovation are two different worlds. I'm not sure if it is the case in other parts of the world, but in our world, it is. And the seventh is get outside advice. Bring the best consultants and ask them and listen to them because growth needs fresh eyes and even from outside of your comfort zone. My eighth tip, maybe one of the most important is adapt. Adapt again and again, be adaptable because things will never work as planned. So always be ready for change. So some of my team will say, why do we plan so much if we are agile and adaptable? It is two sides of the same coin. You need to plan a lot and you need to be adaptable a lot. Then the ninth, take care of your beneficiaries because no matter how many partnerships you forge or investigations you produce and coach, you won't get anywhere without a sizable journalist's base and without being close to them and listen to them. And the 10th is manage conflict, as peacekeeping is vital to manage growth, especially when you are a woman leader in a male dominant domain as we are in. So in summary, the 10th are, define your growth objectives, always think ahead, hire the right people and empower them, embrace technology and new technology and innovate, get outside advice, adapt again and again, and take care of your beneficiaries and manage conflict. Don't believe that growth cannot happen in pandemic year or with COVID-19 and all the surveillance and the situation we live in. You can grow and support your community and continue working in investigative journalism as a woman leader in any work leading an IJ center. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rava. Um, and in case you participants could not uh, write as fast as Ravan spoke, um, Ravan, you prepared a tip sheet, which we will then be able to share through the, through the website of the JIJ, uh, GIJN. Thank you very much for sharing those impressive numbers of Varich 2. And as said, the 10 secrets we will 
put them up as a tip sheet um, to be then accessible. Thank you very much, Ravan. Um, next up is Martin Rayu. Um, and we will move on from managing an organization to managing to grow specifically a female leadership. Thank you very much for sharing your insights, Martin Rayu. Thank you so much, Seth. And uh, thank you for the previous to the previous speakers. Uh, I have learned a lot myself, so I'm sharing my screen now so that we we may start. So it, I want to talk about managing to grow female leadership and basically how you can intentionally make women leaders of the news and newsroom. I will um, just delve into the the slides and from there. Um, I would share some stories. So the objective is very simple. I want somebody on this platform, somebody who is listening uh, to get up and press the switch. That is actually the reason for this meeting. All we are saying is we want you to do something about what you're listening to. So you've heard, um, you've heard my colleagues speak and you will soon hear others speak, get up and you know, press the switch. And the picture that comes to my head is, you know, everybody being in a dark room and we're all talking about how dark the room is and what is wrong with the dark room and how we can do nothing in the dark room. And then at a point, I feel like being the person that screams, somebody needs to get up or I feel like being that person that gets up and, you know, actually presses the switch so that there is light. We've talked a lot about, you know, female persons in leadership generally around the world and in investigative reporting in particular, but somebody needs to get up and actually press the switch so that we can have changes. And I just wanna share tips with you on doing that. So the first thing I believe that I was able to do is to call out the masculinity of the newsroom and the news. I have been able to do this um, by using available evidence. I did a lot of research. I read what was available around the masculinity of the newsroom. I did personal research. So to do this, you can use available research. Otherwise you can create your own data. So we created data back here in Nigeria at the Wallace Shoinka Center for Investigative Journalism. And we found out that at management level through our survey, 10 out of two are, 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 are male at management level, at senior editor level, eight, ratio eight to two in favor of the men, at board management level, ratio seven to two. So we challenged uh, leadership with this data. And then we seized opportunities for conversation. We talked about this a lot, and we actually you know, shared tips to how, to how to ensure that we change it. And we did not just say, just change it. We told them that it was ethical to do this. We told them that it was economically sensible to do this. We told them that it was moral to do this. So call out the masculinity of the newsroom. The next thing is I would like to enjoin you to find potential women leaders. How do you find the leaders? So it's one thing to say we do not have leaders, but I have found that you actually need to create the leaders, so to speak, not just hope that someday they would emerge. We have to intentionally create leaders because I found that so many female persons are not aware that they can be leaders. To do this, you can do it through, you know, putting out a call for application like we do often. You can actually, you know, look through stories in, in, on the screens, in the newspapers, online, and try to find stories written by women that show that they are leaders. You can engage female leaders at the at meetings to find their potential, their potential for leadership. You can ask editors to recommend, and you can always, for all of these tips, you need to have your criteria. What are you looking for? So you're looking for people with passion, with energy, who are willing to see change, people who will do something to actually have the change that, that you want. You are looking people across you know, geopolitical zones. You're looking for people who have um, proximity, people who have the platforms that when you succeed on them, the success will have a huge impact because they are big platforms. You're looking for people who are in leadership or who do not know what to do with it. Then you need to build the capacity. The third thing is that you need to build the capacity of the female reporters. Now, so many researchers, researchers have shown that it is not enough to have female persons in, in leadership. 
if those female persons do not understand what they need to do in those positions, they will not you know, be able to make changes. So you need to make them conscious. You need to wake them up, so to speak. So you will develop research-based learning materials. You will help them to find you know, the right partners. You, would, you, you will find right partners. So you, are, you need resource persons who are patient, who are willing to teach, who are humble, who are going to help you. And you are going to build their capacity for leadership, but you're also going to keep their, build their capacity for mainstreaming girls and women issues. And then you need to provide them opportunity to practice what you have taught them right away as in as fast as possible. Again, you need to develop inclusive investigative story ideas. So there are so many story ideas you can design. When you intentionally you know, develop investigative story ideas, you are able to actually draw in you know, female reporters to actually act on the things that you have taught them. You have to mobilize you know, a network ensure that you don't just treat people, train people as individuals, but you connect them to one another and you make them a support group that, you know, you have a sense of, you know, corporate achievement and you have a sense of even individual achievement and celebrating that as a group achievement because when one woman wins, all women have won because she's able to make way for others. And then you need to engage media leaders. We have gone so many times to newsrooms to challenge media leaders with the statistics that we have and insist that they change the number of people in their management, insist that they include female persons in their board of directors so that we can have the change that we want. So just to mention that and everything that I've talked about is good for female girls and women issues for including um, investigative reporters that are female, but these tips are also useful for any beats and any type of media work that you are doing. So again, I want to remind you to switch that damn light on because we can't keep talking about the darkness. We need somebody to do something about it. Thank you. Thank you, Matanrai, for encouraging us to switch on the light. Um, thank you for, for, for being with us. Um, next up, Sherry, um, you're coming to us all the way from Taiwan, and we entitled your input um, of seven minutes with managing professionalism. So please let us know, fill us in what this is all about. Okay, it's a very big topic. Um, it's very nice to be here. Uh, tonight, I would like to share how to strengthen investigative professionalism in the newsroom as a female leader. Uh, listen to a uh, uh, lot of uh, wonderful women's uh, sharing. Uh, actually, I still try to find joy uh, from the bitterness because I think it's, it's kind of very tough uh, journey for me to be a leader. Uh, even though I, I'm in this industry for 23 years, I'm have been leader for 10 years. I, I still feel that uh, I need a lot of uh, persuasive way to to go to that journey. Uh, so today, my advice is based on my personal experience. I hope it can be somewhat helpful. And my first advice, don't let your gender define who you are and what you can do. There is no topic woman can't do. And being female shouldn't be the reason that holds you back from going after what you are interested in. We have done a lot of investigative reports, such as human trafficking, pharmacy fishing industry, illicit drug stealing, illegal land transaction, and so on. And those topics are not typical traditional female journalists step into, but a lot of girls, they are very good at that. When we faced the danger during this investigation, I observed my female colleagues showed more great determination. Their tenacity for facts and dauntless nature really helps our interviewees to speak to us and reveal the truth. So, um, we throw ourselves into investigative journalism. We know that the nature of it is not like general news reporting. Uh, the nature of it is to expose the inconvenient truth. If we can fully understand the nature of investigative journalism, and if we can build up the mindset, keep learning new investigative uh, approaches with disciplines, I think there's no topic women cannot uh, dig into. And my second advice, uh, don't forget your non-journalist members. Richard just uh, mentioned, don't be a lone wolf. Uh, I think an ideal leader of an investigation 
newsroom has to be like a dedicated hedgehog that knows how to dig into newsworthy topics. But it is equally important to be like a fox that knows something besides journalism, which means a leader should also know your IT engineers, designers, uh, podcast team members, and social media staffs. This is because journalism, good investigative journalism, is always a teamwork. However, I noticed that uh, the turnover rate for these non-journalist members is really high in this industry. So what should we do? I think uh, understand their logic languages and their working procedures. I remember back in the days, I was also one, the one who made this mistake. I asked my uh, designer and say, uh, can, can you just do it quick and simple? This really made my designer uh, upset. Uh, so we had a very like false understanding of how designing jobs were done. And after that, I know their procedures. I learned their procedures and we get along very well. So to avoid such situation, try to spend time knowing your uh, non-journalist wor uh, uh, colleagues working procedures. Bring your non-journalist staff closer, build their sense of uh, build their sense of accomplishment and think their career path, no matter how small your room is. And my third advice, uh, this is the, the one I really want to address. It's about management style. No matter what your management style is, it is rational or affiliative. Being authentic is the key. As a leader, we spend a lot of time in communicating. When it comes to communication, female leaders are always labeled as bossy or emotional, while male leaders rarely get comments like that. So my suggestion, be aware of those nuances. Bossy or demanding can be misogyny comments for female leaders with a professional and a resolute attitude. When female leaders are trying to be flexible, people will describe it as unpredictable. My point is, it's important to fully understand the nuances among these adjectives. Find your own management style and speak for yourself instead of letting people define who you are. Uh, I want to give you an example. My, my colleague once told me, Sherry, you play bad cop well. In the beginning, I was silent and I don't know how to reply. And next week, there is uh, another guy said the same thing. Sherry, you play bad cop well. You know, a lot of rumors uh, will spread, especially when you are a female leader. And that time I replied, a leader's role is not to be a likable character, but to take responsibil responsibilities. No one likes to play bad cop. I have to make decisions for greater good of this organization. So being stern is a personal choice, not a personal preference. Please don't use that uh, expression again. And from then on, I have never heard people make that kind of mindless quip again. So if people around you make a false interpretation, sometimes this interpretation from women, you, has, you have to clarify your stance, being authentic and people will get to know your style. And my, my fourth advice, I, I think I, I should, yeah, I think, um, Roman just mentioned about how to manage conflicts. I have the same idea. Many leaders tend to pat uh, their colleagues on the back and say, everything will be fine. No, things won't be fine if you don't fix it. If you choose to turn a blind eye on the internal conflicts among key members of the team, the momentary peaceful illusion will fuel a more serious conflict in the future. Um, I have seen a lot of female leaders. They have the wisdom to see the, to see through the cracks of the conflict. So turn the crisis into the opportunity. Set a tone for your principle. Clarify the do's and uh, don'ts when you fix problems. And also, you can help your colleagues become their better self. And my last advice. Uh, next, um, on my leader's journey. I have asked myself a lot of times, maybe a uh, hundred times before, before 40, I asked myself, why me? When I face setbacks and the difficulties, 
uh, I may question myself, am I fit for a leader? Is, is the path I must go on? And look back to the way I came across, I will advise you to imagine a beyond stage. Go beyond asking, why me stage? Okay, it's not easy, but we need to uh, get help or we need to help ourselves. Uh, I don't have time to go to the details, but actually we are here to find which way fits each of us as a leader. We may have different ways, but no matter what, don't waste time, doubt yourselves. We already chose a difficult journey. We should try to find joys from those bitterness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sherry, for filling us in um, on how to manage professionalism, as we called it. Um, and you already touched on one point, and now we're doing a quick deep dive, at least, uh, with you, Marina, on that, um, and that is managing yourself. Thank you very much for sharing your insights and expertise, and we're glad to have you here. Thank you so much. Still, okay, I've been learning so much already and taking notes from everything our colleagues have said here. Um, it is fitting that I am the last one today because I am going to talk about something very essential in our growth as leaders and that very essential thing uh, without which we can't really be, our work cannot be sustainable in the mid or in the long term is you is taking care of ourselves and our well-being. Um, and often this comes as um, a little bit of a, an afterthought. So let me go ahead and share quickly my screen and let's get started here, managing ourselves. Uh, why don't we start with a little bit of a, a diagnostic? Um, here are some phrases I have heard, overheard in the newsroom. And you know what, uh, in reality, I have sent said all these things myself so many times. I wonder if you identify with some of them, if you have heard similar things, especially from women leaders, from women managers. Here are a few that ring a little bit true to me. I am exhausted, but it's worth it. We are changing the world. I will take vacation promise when we finally publish this monster. I am overwhelmed, but it's a good overwhelmed. I even once printed this really embarrassing phrase in a t-shirt. And in fact, it was several, several of us at ICIJ, my former um, organization, where I worked for 15 years, convincing uh, lone wolf investigative reporters around the world to collaborate rather than compete. So what happens is that when this kind of pressure becomes the norm, the only thing that can ensue is burnout, right? And in that sense, it's not surprising that uh, women study after study shows that are burning out at a rate so much higher than men. I narrowly avoided burnout when I was at ICIJ, but that wasn't the case for other of my colleagues. We were all dedicated, we were on a mission, uh, we felt we were really changing journalism. And I think in some ways we were but some of us lost a little bit of sight of ourselves. So here's the first insight. Why prioritize ourselves? Because how we take care of ourselves has a direct impact on the quality of the work we put out and the well-being of those that we are leading. So if we care so much as we say we do about our investigations and about the people that, uh, that we are leading, then we need to be able to prioritize our own well-being. So here are a few tips I'm going to share um, that I have learned along the way that uh, wiser people than I am have shared with me. And let's start with the big picture, right? We stress so much about our careers and what comes next. So the first thing I'm going to share is that careers are not linear, nor is life. Careers are more of like a mix of intentionality, serendipity, and allies. And we need to be able to be flexible and to be able to embrace the zigs and the zags and the turns and the pivots that are part of our career. Quick example, I was a senior reporter in Argentina. I moved to the US for financial reasons in part to help my family. And then when I came here, my first job was as an intern at ICIJ. 
My parents thought I was crazy, that I was going back in my career. And in reality, I was turking, taking a pivot, a turn that changed my career in, a, in an amazing way, the whole trajectory of my career. So embracing those pivots. When you are in those pivot moments, in those change turn moments, build a list. And a helpful list that I have built uh, myself in many of these situations is the following. What am I good at? What are my superpowers, my strengths, the things that I, that I do really well? Second list, what is important to me? And this is not just related to work. What other things in life are important to me? And third, what organizations I admire and why? And in, in this sense, think not only about your field or your current beat, but think broadly. Let's talk about imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is, is a very real thing. I thought that I was the only one that from time to time had these feelings of being inadequate or not belonging until I got a fellowship at Stanford University. And there I learned that apparently half of the students working, uh, walking, studying in that uh, campus, those really overachieving students, they feel like they don't belong there. They have this imposter syndrome, which is this little voice in our head that tell us that somehow we're not good enough, we're not uh, accomplished enough, and that maybe we don't belong in the, in the jobs that, uh, that we have. So when you experience that, first know that you are not alone, that a lot of, especially female leaders in journalism feel this. Second of all, there are ways to work around that. And here are a few um, quick tips. So revisit the work that you are proud of. Um, you can revisit the list that you built before that we talked about. Learn to filter out negative voices that are going to come, come your way and are going to uh, hit your different times of your career. This is not like the constructive criticism that I'm talking about. This is, this is the kind of uh, unconstructive criticism. I was once told that I would never get a job in journalism in the US unless I got rid of my Spanish accent. As you can see and here, I haven't gotten rid of that accent and I have gotten more than one dream job in the US. Have your sweet SWAT team, your uh, group of uh, colleagues and friends who know you well and that you can go to when that voice starts appearing in your head and they can give you a reality check. They know what you have accomplished. They'll know what to do. Achieve outside of work whether it's uh, boxing, painting, dancing, or playing pickleball, um, like I do. And if you don't know what pickleball is, I don't blame you. We can talk offline. And finally, if you're a manager, know that you know, people in your team, especially your overachievers, the overachievers in your team, they might be feeling also their own pressures and imposter syndrome. So provide a specific and often provide feedback uh, to people that work with you. Uh, learn to say no. This is why is this so hard? Learning saying no is so hard, first of all, because we um, don't want to offend people, uh, because we might be experiencing fear of missing out, FOMO, or because we actually think that we can do it all. And so we end up deluding ourselves, uh, deluded in countless unimportant and essential commitments and obligations and losing sight of what is really essential and where we can make a real important contribution. So what is the alternative? Uh, the alternative is to set boundaries and to communicate those boundaries. I have a colleague at work who uh, um, blocks time in his calendar for balcony time. What is balcony time? Is think. He, he, he tell us, this is the time when I'm going to be thinking about the big picture. Every week or every day, this is my time. He communicates it and by setting those boundaries that are empowering and that are liberating, why, why are they liberating? Because he doesn't have to tell us no then. We know that that is his special protected time. And I have another colleague who does the same, but for his daughter. So there are 30 minutes in the middle of the day that is Rose's time. And nobody there go anywhere near Rose's time. And finally, practice JOMO instead of FOMO. And JOMO is joy of missing out. Uh, the uh, final thing I would share is uh, a concept that I learned during my fellowship at Stanford as well that at first shocked me. And it's called practice institutional disloyalty. It shocked me because to me, 
loyalty is a core value. But don't worry, this doesn't mean that you have to do anything bad to your organization. All it means is that you have to learn to separate your identity, Marina, you have to separate it from the organization that you so much love. And the reason you do that is um, so you can be at your best and at your healthiest when you do that important work. And one good question we can ask ourselves is where do we derive our internal validation from? Where does your internal validation come from? When I asked myself this three years ago, I had to admit almost 100% of my internal validation was coming from my work. And so uh, my friends gave me homework and that homework was create a list, do a major brainstorm, 100 ideas of healthy habits, things that you used to do and you stopped doing, things that you would love to do again uh, or that you would love to explore that would bring all these other dimensions back into your life. So I invite you to do your brainstorm, 100, 100 healthy habit brainstorms. You will discover things. I'm still going through this list, of course, and trying uh, new things. And finally, with this, I finish. There are uh, uh, three things that have helped me set boundaries and to stay real through my career. And those are my family, my SWAT team of amazing investigative female journalists. And I go to them very, very often, you know, when I'm feeling a little, you know, shaky. And this one is dance. I love dancing. I love, I love tango dancing. And you know what tango dancing is full of pivots and turns and unexpected moments, just like our career and just like life. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much, Marina, for sharing um, the personal, rather personal insights with us. Um, may I ask all speakers to switch on their video again so that we can see you. Hey, again, thank you very, very much, all of you, um, for joining us today, for being as open as one can whilst being recorded and knowing that this panel might be ending up on YouTube at some point in time. Um, we very much appreciate uh, learning from your experiences. Um, to kick off, uh, I would like to come back to a question that was the very first and is rather a broad question that was put out in the chat channel, um, which is, how to transition from news reporting to investigative reporting. Um, and since we started of, with you, Rachel, navigating the broader ecosystem, um, could you jump in and share your thoughts and tips? So from news or beat reporting to investigative reporting, um, I think be curious, ask questions about, so don't just take the um, immediate news, which is reporting what's happening now, but always ask the question of why is what's happening now? And is there something that I need to know more about? Um, and if you start asking those questions and then finding out some information that might answer those questions, um, that is the sort of news that news desks will want. It's that off diary news is something that is exclusive. Um, and also get yourself noticed. I think that's one of the, the key things. And as a women, we're, we're often not great at getting ourselves noticed, but you know, we have great ideas. We have a lot of curiosity. So thinking about the areas that you're interested in and just keep them plugging away. Can I do something on this subject? Oh, I've got, I've asked this question and I found out this bit of information and it's a really important area that I think should be covered. Thank you for that, Rachel. Matunyayu, same, same question to you. Uh, do you have concrete tips on top of what you've shared for women reporters, women editors, to, so to speak, not switch profession, but moving from beat reporting to investigative reporting specifically? Okay, so I, I, would, I would say that imitation is good. Imitate those who have done it. Read the works of people who have done investigative work see what they did, 
and try to imitate that. And one of the ways we have gotten female reporters who did not do investigations to start doing was that we actually got them to go from where they were comfortable to link up with the new beats. So for instance, um, people covering the extractives, um, we found out from research that there were not enough female reporters who covered the extractives. So what we did was to actually bring together a number of female reporters, and then we mapped out human interest angles that they could use as entry points because um, oil and gas specifically is very complicated, for instance. So but what we did was we found human rights, human angles, angles like environment, angles like impact on people. And then we help them to develop story strategies and pitches so that they could do it. And then we attached them with mentors who guided them through the way. So you could get a mentor, you could imitate someone, you could actually start from your comfort zone and build up to something new. Thank you, Matanra. That, that is sort of close to what you said, Sherry, right? That um, obviously there are more womenish topics that probably women are pushed, rather pushed to cover, um, but we should have the courage um, to go out and explore any topic because even though that our agenda is uh, being a woman, we have the possibility obviously to cover any other topics as good as our male colleagues. Um, uh, I remember in 2016, uh, I joined the GIJC conference first, the first year. I remember it's, Gabby can re remind me, I remember it's in Nepal. And in Nepal, I found so many excellent journalists. It's the first time I tried to figure out what's the uh, human trafficking on forestry fishing industry. And uh, I didn't know how to do that. I met uh, Martha Mendoza from AP. I met a lot of excellent journalists from uh, Temple, uh, Indonesia. Actually, at that, it, in, at that moment, I only have an iceberg of these uh, stories, but they helped me to pull out the ice mountain because they have skills, they have this kind of experience. Uh, so I learned a lot from GIJN's members uh, because we did a lot of cross-border investigation together. So I think if you want to move to the investigation, you can move fast, but in small steps. Don't set a very high goal, but you can uh, set a goal higher. And you can uh, um, ask a lot of mentors uh, in, in within this group. It is a big network and you can find, they have backgrounds, they have good at different topics. And if you want to do uh, any topics, you can find the right person, right mentor here. Thank you very much, Sherry. I'd, I'd like to read out a question from uh, Halima. Uh, Halima writes in the chat, in situations where one is discouraged by experienced investigative journalists to drop a story idea about procurement and contract scandal and the lack of willingness from people involved to participate in making the work a success due to fear of being a target, what can one do? Yeah, and I, and I think this is, we can merge the a previous question that we had about how to sell female center work, you know, for example, story on abortion, how to convince or persuade your editor when you are trying to pitch story that maybe they, they really don't want to, to publish. Yeah, that's a, that's a good call, Gabby. Yeah. Um, the, that was from Marlene Oops coming, yeah. that she, which she shared in the chat as well. Marlene, you wrote us that you were asked to drop a story on abortion and your male editor or mentor, tutor, you write, said that it was not quote unquote systemic enough as abortion was legally regulated and accessible in the countries that you were looking at. How, what can one do rather than do you have input for us? Yeah, every, every time, because we are a training institute in the sense and essence of our work, and we coach and mentor um, a lot of female journalists who never worked in investigative journalism and want to go into this. Uh, first, safety is extremely important. And for female journalists, there's also the online harassment, the digital safety that should be taken care of physical 
as well. So comprehensive safety from physical safety to digital safety, to legal support, to psycho support, and even to career support that many of the institutions don't, don't care about comprehensive safety. But safety should not be played as a way to stop us from doing our investigations. There is a lot of ways to stay safe and maybe not publish in your own name uh, and not to be exposed even to uh, sources and many other parties, but be safe. Uh, so we need to listen to our editors, our coaches and uh, experienced journalists, and at the same time, find ways to do our investigative journalism work safe. Uh, I think it's extremely important not to look at specific topics are less important than others. For example, gender issues or environment or medicine in comparison to politics or follow the money topics. That's extremely wrong. And one of the ways how to pitch a strong story is to come prepared, is to come for the editorial committee and the editor in chief and the uh, person who will approve this story to go ahead well prepared. Well prepared means to uh, do our homework very well, uh, get the proofs, spend more time working before pitching the idea. It's very difficult for an editor to say no to a well prepared story and uh, also not to accept, accept no as an answer. So sometimes there is no, but then we go ahead again and try to pitch it in another way, another angle with more evidences, with uh, more sources. And if you believe of your story, I'm sure you will find a way to get this story out. Thank you for I that. Add, yes. I agree with everything that has been said. And I want to add that at the Pulitzer Center where I work now, we have uh, many funds reporting grant specifically for uh, gender stories. So anybody out there, who needs that support to take a story from very good to great, to, to turn, uh, you know, uh, uh, or to pitch it to other outlets once uh, that story, if, if it has been turned out, uh, please come to us and uh, we will be happy to consider uh, your story for support. Thank you, for Marina, for pointing towards the Pulitzer Center. There's one question, and uh, Ravan, you already touched base on it. Um, uh, the keyword is digital harassment. Um, this is Freya asking, how often do you experience digital harassment? And uh, she directs, Freya, you direct your question to all of the panelists. Um, Ravan, do you yeah. want to go first? We, we, we noticed, and there is, you know, several studies, IWMF, ICFJ, UNESCO, did a lot of studies about the rise of online harassment and digital harassment during COVID time, especially with the pandemic, we shifted all our work from the actual to the virtual. And so the harassment itself shifted to digital harassment, and there's digital bullying and uh, uh, digital hate speech. There's a lot of those. And unfortunately, we have have uh, experienced this with our female journalists in the region. And unfortunately, also, uh, many of them did not know how to deal with this because there's not enough uh, experience and raising capacity on, on how to deal with this, especially in communities that are very conservative or tribal communities where they also don't share what's happening with their families. And uh, this is where uh, support from IJ centers and psycho support should come. It's very difficult for uh, women in our region to go the legal route. And this is why we support them with the psycho support route. I would say it's extremely important to recognize this when it happens, to know exactly how to report even for the social media platforms. And all of them, they know they are part of the problem and all of them know they need to be part of the solution. And so it's extremely important to re report this uh, when it's happening, to know exactly how to uh, ask for help and support and not to be silent uh, towards this. We in Arij, and I'll put this in the chat, launched uh, one year ago a project called I Will Not Stay Silent. 
uh, raising capacity for female journalists and investigative female journalists in the region through webinars, through an in-depth diploma, through digital one-to-one -one clinics, because facing this cannot happen only with digital workshops and webinars. You need one-to-one -one support to be able to deal with that and with psycho support. It's extremely important. It's a taboo in some societies to talk about this, and we need not to be silent. Thank you, Raven. And yes, please share um, the details of the project. Um, I, I will not stay silent. Um, Marina, you have been with the ICAJ and you've done very high profile investigations. Have you, in the aftermath, so to speak, after publication, have you experienced harassment, specifically uh, hate speech in the digital sphere? Um, I, I haven't personally experienced it, but I know that many uh, journalists, and, and I don't think there was a gender that divide in, in this case, uh, it was just generally um, uh, journalists were being attacked. And, and what resonates is what, what we said before, you know, uh, this um, concept that because something is legal, uh, it's quote unquote legal, then it shouldn't be investigated. Why are you even messing with this? You know, the offshore world, oh, this is all legal. This is not investigative. And what we say is that because it's legal, precisely because it's legal, that is a problem because these are incredibly immoral issues. So um, uh, we, uh, what we, we have seen journalists, for example, in Ecuador who had to um, completely get removed themselves from, from Twitter or from other social media because just the pressure was so much after the investigations came out. Um, I agree totally with Rawan that uh, there are um, ways to fight this and that we need to make it public and that we need to build that capacity so journalists don't have to end up just having to silence themselves or closing their accounts. Uh, there are organizations that can help and I would recommend, for example, the International Women Media Foundation, Women Photographs, Black women photographers. There are many um, uh, organizations that are ready uh, to step in and to support, uh, especially women when they are facing this kind of harassment. Thank you um, also for specifically pointing out that there are organizations out there that do offer support. Sherry, from your point of view, what can you report from Taiwan? Oh, you mean the safety issue? Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't uh, faced the. Uh, um, sorry. Sorry. Um, there are some examples. It's about China factor. When we dig into the uh, Uyghur um, camp, we, my, my colleagues, they, they are not female, but um, they do face some threat from from hike and uh, also after the hong kong social movement and uh, the situation in china all my freelancers now are um, actually in danger so they move their real name from facebook from twitter so we have to use other um other email systems and other app to communicate each other also, one of my um, my freelancer are this uh, are missed. Mm. So I think it's not a harassment. It's not a gender issue. It's a, a investigative journalists uh, what they are facing now. We we are facing a China factor, and it's very difficult for us to to write articles in China. We have to write outside China. But even if you write stories outside China you still uh, have the chance to be hacked. So it's what uh, the problems we are dealing, uh, dealing with as an investigative journalist. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Matanja, you, how, what advice do you have uh, to share with us? Well, first, I, I totally agree with all the other speakers mm -hmm. that this is a big issue. Um, but also to call it out that in terms of female reporters, it can also be specific and what is different, what I noticed is that um, sometimes just like physical harassment, it can be normalized. People can say it wasn't anything, it wasn't a big deal, um, live with it, you know, that's what happens. And I think that it is important that we uh, join forces, collaborate with others to ensure that 
um, abuse, whether online or offline, is not normalized. That we ensure that we speak to media leaders, especially um, in Africa. And I'm sure, I mean, I've been around so many other regions, and I find that it is surprisingly the same. You know, there's this normalization of some um, beginning levels of harassment, so to speak. And people, you know, shrug it and say it was just plain or she was just. Playing. So I think that it is very important, in addition to all that have been said, that we do not normalize it and we actually ensure that the issues are escalated, that they are escalated, and that on those public spaces, a lot of time, you know, editors and the rest of the people, they are quiet. So on those social media platforms, we need the leaders of newsroom to speak more about these issues and actually, you know, call it out even before there are cases that they know of so that people are aware that we do not agree that it is okay. Thank you, Matanya. There is one question from uh, Frau Geraya that I know, Marina, you are the perfect one to answer, which is about life balance and life balance in the sense of how do you handle and juggle a job and a family? Yeah, and I think I would add to that question, and maybe that's for you, uh, for some of you also, on the other hand, for the people that don't have kids, also, how do you balance? Because the, there is a lot of time people saying, okay, because I don't have kids, they think I have all the time of the work to, to do extra hours, and that's so whoever, if any of you don't have kids and can also give that perspective will be useful. What I would say is like um, in the concept, I, I like the concept of work-life integration more than work-life balance. So how do we make our, um, you know, our children, our family part of our work, our work part of our family, it's all, you know, it's all together. And so that means that to my children, I'm very open about my work with them. We talk about work. We talk sometimes at the, at the dinner table, not all the time. We also talk about other things, but I don't want them to, to think about mommy, like her work is this corner now of the house where she's working or, or, or some office I've never been to. And, and I want them to know exactly what I do and, and why I do it and why I'm so passionate about. And then I work at work. I also try to bring my um, personal life to work sometimes when it's appropriate. Uh, and talk about my children and celebrate my children and and sometimes when I have my little team meetings also talk uh, you know uh, about what's going on in their lives so kind of normalize uh, and integrate uh, these worlds that should always be together they are uh, they are who we are uh, never hide it never be ashamed of it just do your excellent amazing work and everything else will take care of itself um, uh, I would probably uh, share something else in a little bit, but I want to uh, turn it over to some one of the other colleagues here. Yeah, I would only, only jump to say that I am the worst to advise on this because I don't think I'm doing it like with the 100 habits routine. It's even the 10 habits routine that I'm not sticking to all the time. So every Christmas, before Christmas, I say I need to change. I need to do more balance to myself and it doesn't work. It's uh, It takes you all over. So maybe after this session, I will try again to learn into this. I liked so much uh, Yushiko from Japan when she said that she has two female cats and the cats will learn about leadership with with her. So um, I, I, I think I, I failed in this integration or the balance between the two things so, um, but um, it's it's not something that really I regret it's something that I try to to do it better for myself um, but I don't have the perfect equation. Martina you chipped in another keyword um, work-life effectiveness yes, what is that all about? The, yeah a colleague of mine um, Nekal Kekeyaru talks about this. She works at the business school here in Lagos and she talks about the fact that it really would never be balanced. So we need to cut ourselves some slack and you know, forgive ourselves our heads sometimes. And what you just need to do is that when you're at home, you maximize what home is and what you need to do there. And when you're at work, you, know, you do your best at work. And you know, like Marina said, let all the parties know that they all matter and they are important while you try your best where you are at a particular time. 
And to finish up, Rachel, please repeat what you just wrote in the in the chat. It fits perfectly. Well, I, I said embrace the messiness. I think that's, you know, I have three children and I have managed leadership roles with that family. And I used to put my job first and it would always be like, shush, children, shush, shush, shush. I'm in really important work hall. And actually, if you say to the work hall, look, I'm dealing with two children who are having a big screaming row. Um, I'm just going to knock off from the phone for two secs and I'll call you back because it will be more effective. Um, I think, you know, everyone said here, you've just got to embrace what your, what your life is. And there is no solution. There is no perfect way of doing it. There are no 100 best habits. It's just embrace the difficulty and the messiness and accept. But don't try, don't try and push one of them aside. Hey, thank you. Gabby, do you have yeah. time for one more question? What do you uh, think? I think we have one more question, but we need to, to finish quite soon because there is a, a time limit. So let's tackle the last question quickly. And that is coming from a apparently a young reporter that would like to step foot into investigative reporting. Um, so as a, for a career starter, so to speak, what's the one advice you have? I would say Same. believe in yourself. Don't wait for other people to give you permission to be an investigative reporter or they find you as one. Find your angle, find your story, pursue it, do it. Thank you. And I think we'll finish up with that. Do it. It's about doing rather um, than waiting. Thank you, all of you, for having us yeah. um, for being able to have you um Gabby that's yeah. your turn yeah we have a few minutes so I would like to do a little summary as a graphic recorder I think I don't have work a good job but at least I have this and as in base the, the messiness I can show my real background with all the toys <laughs> that all these amazing journalists were saying, don't hide and don't hide. And I was mostly hiding because I wanted some visual clarity, but I totally agree with Marina that the more we incorporate our kids into our life and we don't try to hide it. I share this, this Michelle Obama podcast and she was talking how we, when she and, and Valerie Jarrett were saying in meetings, I need to go, it's, the Hallow it's Halloween and I need to be with my kids and that how how as a leader saying this out loud also paved the way for the young reporters who are looking at you and who in 10 or 20 years will stand up of a meeting and say, today is Halloween, I need to go. So let's do a quick summary. All the presentations are online. We are creating, a, which I think it's, it's awesome, a collaborative tip sheet, all of us with tips and links. So be patient, it takes a little time because we are all adding, but it will be really good. And let me point all of you out to the GIGN Women Resources page that has been, it has been sharing on the chat. It's simply amazing. Even I found a lot of groups that are now for me like a day-to-day -day source of wisdom. So go and check them. So from Rachel, my main takeaway is this thing about being the only woman and how your voice in fact matters even more. If you are in that situation, you need to seek to others but you need to give yourself a break. Um, Rawan, these two sides of the coin between adapting again and again, but also planning and how, how to balance this uh, and the importance of hiring the right people. And a shout out here to the amazing women that we have at GIGN have, has been helping in all this. And also to Anne Koch, who is one of the co-creators of the GIGN Women Group and who started this session in Hamburg. From Motun Rayo, uh, the issue of intention, how to make leaders, how to create leaders, how to find a network, how to support. It's, it's really putting yourself out there. I'm, I'm making a plan. From Jerry, the, the women determination, uh, the importance of focusing on all your team and not just on journalists and trying to learn from each other. Uh, this was good. Don't waste time doubting yourself. I apologize if it's not verbatim, but I think that was great. You are there, you have the position. Now just move. Don't waste time doubting. It doesn't make any sense and be authentic. Um, the risk of being a people pleaser or a bad cop. 
Uh, Marina, okay. Marina is always a source. Is also kind of mentor for me on the well-being aspect. So this question that she gave to all of you, she gave them to me a few months ago. So go and do it. Uh, careers are not linear. Be careful of burnout. Uh, why? Because it has a direct impact of the one you lead. You need to to take care of yourself. Um, as a manager, don't forget about frequent specific feedback and try to replace FOMO, fear of missing out for the joy of missing out. Uh, that's really important. And don't forget that not all is work and you also need to find validation outside of work. So I think we all have a lot to think about. I kindly invite you if you have time, we are going to move to another Zoom, but this one would be totally relaxed. We are all going to be camera on, bring a coffee, bring a drink, and we will keep chatting with Silke, Anne, and myself. So if you have time, come to that meetup because it won't be recorded. And don't forget that all the speakers here, all the women at GIGN and the women group, we are here to help so we can continue the conversation and take the questions that we couldn't. Thanks a lot, Silke, for the co-moderation and to these awesome speakers. It was a pleasure to to join this Zoom with you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Keep safe. Bye.